Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to this program that's jointly sponsored by the Riley Center for Media and Public Affairs here at the Manship School at LSU, uh, and uh, also sponsored by the uh, PRSSA. And we have some members here, Brad Lambert, the chapter president, and other members. We welcome you to the journalism building for this program today. We're honored to have with us one of the most talented and respected political minds in the country today. Doug Sosnick served as White House political director for President Bill Clinton and was a senior strategist for the 2004 presidential campaign of Senator John Kerry. Prior to joining the White House staff, Doug Sosnick served on the staff of the Senate, the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee and was chief of staff for Connecticut Senator Chris Dodd. He is co-author of the 2006 book, Applebee's America, How Successful Political Business and Religious Leaders Connect with the New American Community. In Time Magazine in September of this year, Mark Halperin wrote this about Doug Sosnick. He is one of the smartest people in American politics. A Democrat who worked for, among others, Bill Clinton, he is the rare partisan who is able to engage in dispassionate analysis about the two major parties and their candidates, and we'll, we'll see that very clearly in a moment when he begins to speak. Doug now serves as Senior Vice President for League Initiatives for the National Basketball Association. We're delighted to have him here for not only this program, but for this weekend's game between Alabama and, and LSU. Please join me in welcoming to the Manship School, Doug Sosnick. So I want to talk for a few minutes, kind of give you an overview of what I think is going on. Then I'm going to show some slides, uh, give you some proof points, and then you can take some questions. And you can interrupt me anytime if you don't like what I'm saying or disagree with it, and um, we'll take it from there. Let me start by saying I've been in pol working in politics now for 35 years, and I've never watched a more uninspiring campaign than this campaign. I've never seen two candidates who have had less to say about what they would do if they won than these two candidates. And I've never seen in a country where so many people aren't involved in determining the outcome of this campaign. We've got uh, probably really 42 states, 40 states, have been a bystander to this election. Uh, and watched as the other eight states have decided who the president will be. And over a billion dollars has been spent on TV ads by these two campaigns. And 800 and and I'm watching the Northern, you know, Northern Virginia is a big part, so I mean, every single minute is an ad, and it doesn't make any ads have any impact, probably. Uh, so I've been doing this for a long time, and I, I'm the kind of guy that likes to think I know what's going on and based on history, and pretty much everything I've thought based on history uh, would happen based on what I've seen is exactly been the opposite. And I refer to it earlier as the upside-down cycle, and so what I mean by that, and I'll show you in a minute, is when you look at the economic condition of the country, When you look at Romney's favorability, unfavorability number, you would never think it'd be a competitive race. Um, if you look at how static the election has been all year, you'd never think that 90 minutes in Denver could have such an out outcome. When you look at how much the economy has improved in the last six weeks in terms of how people think it's going, you would you know, you'd never think Obama's been going down in the polls while that's happened. Uh, the, um, the last three elections have been change elections. If you look at what's going on in the public's mind about the condition of the country and where they want the country to go and they want change, this looks like it'll be the first election in three cycles in which the country's going to go from the status quo, even though the public wants change. So none of it makes sense, at least to me, um, although I'm supposed to pretend like it does. Um, but I think the bottom line is I think Obama's probably going to win. The Republicans after the election are going to uh, blame the liberal media for for talking about the hurricane so much and helping the incumbent president win because of the hurricane. And um, and I think the truth is actually uh, that uh, one ad probably made the difference in the whole campaign and it hasn't changed. Uh, and I'll show you the ad in a few minutes and I'll tell you why. Um, but the bottom line is I think. 
sometimes even conventional wisdom is right. And the conventional wisdom is, is that Ohio determines the outcome, and I think it does determine the outcome of what Obama did in Ohio, in part because he's had all sort of them, uh, and I think he'll get reelected um, without even a shred of uh, a mandate. So that cheerful note. <laughs> so I, I'm really so unaccustomed to being in a place where the technology works. <laughs> That's a big screen. So, where I come from, what I do for a living, whatever that is, uh, you look at wrong track as the best leading indicator of where the country's headed. And so, if I knew nothing, which some people would say I did it, but if I knew nothing and I looked at this chart of wrong track at 53%, I'd say the incumbent uh, is dead. He'll never get reelected. No incumbent's ever gotten reelected with a wrong track that high. If you look at the left, you can see the disillusionment that at least the majority of the country has felt about Obama since he took office. If you look on the left, <coughs> the red is the wrong track, the blue is the right track. When he took office, the lines had, 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 had joined. And if I had shown you October of 2008, in the final days of the Bush presidency, the wrong track was up to about 85%. But anyway, the lines came down and met at the beginning of the Obama presidency. And you see how over time people became increasingly disillusioned with Obama's president. And so the wrong track ballooned up to over 6 out of 10 people um, by uh, the, the uh, summer of 2011. And as you can see, the trending is positive now, or more positive, to the right in terms of the right track. And if you look at, as I mentioned a minute ago, if you look at the uh, Obama horse race numbers, They've been going down as the right track's been going up. So none of it makes sense. And his approval is pretty much 50%, which is really at the cusp of this actually does make sense. This is where you're at the cusp of 50% to get reelected. If it's 49, you probably would. If it's 51, you definitely would. If it's 48, 47, you probably won't. So he's been teetering on the edge. And you can see how, starting with 2412, which is the beginning of Republican primaries, you can see how you know the, the estimation is that six billion dollars being spent in politics this year, like two and a half billion of it on the presidential. You can look at how it really had any impact. Nothing's really changed. They moved the country from static on how they feel the president's doing. And you know this is elections. We all know about one issue and one issue only is the economy. And you can see that Obama's numbers are lagging there <coughs> as well. With over fifty percent of the people disapproving of the job that he's doing. And this is a chart that's never been done before. This is a nominee for the presidency of the United States who has never had a positive rating, favorable, unfavorable, the entire election. Uh, now, I think his numbers may be marginally positive now, but fundamentally, you've never seen that before. There's never been a candidate this week. And this is a, uh, I hate this slide because it makes it look like Romney's been ahead the whole time. Um, this is a Washington Post poll. Essentially, the race has been mostly a 49-48 race. You can see that's all considered by pollsters the margin of error. But this is a race that really hasn't moved much. Uh, it did move in October uh, after the first debate in Denver. Uh, and Romney had some momentum after that, a disproportionate amount of the momentum, though, it's happened everywhere, so you can't deny that, first of all. But secondly, a disproportionate amount of that momentum or favorable increase for Romney has occurred outside of the most important states uh, to win the 270. And so that's why it's misleading about where the race stands when you look at national poll numbers. So on three out of four issues right now relating to the economy, uh, uh, Romney has uh, got an advantage over Obama. Uh, again, you look at a chart like that, you say, well, Romney's going to kill him. Basically, tied on taxes, and he's got a substantial lead uh, on the economy, jobs, and unemployment, and the deficit. And um, you know, he's, he's not he's not ahead. Uh, so, this is uh, the unemployment numbers came out uh, this morning nationally. They're now at seven point nine percent. This chart shows.
shows you uh, they had 172,000 roughly new jobs, which is much higher than people expected, which is good for Obama. It's based on data, so he's just letting it down in the polls. But this is um, the unemployment numbers by state for September. And it shows several things to me. Uh, the darker the color, the worse the unemployment rate. And it shows so how diverse the economic problems in our country are and have been. Um, where it's in the past, you often see regional recessions. This has been one that's in totality. The industrial Midwest one was really a depression coming out of the manufacturing economy in which you had to change the whole economic base of the, of the, of the local economy, which is you know, they went from making automobiles and other manufacturing now to basically fracking for natural, natural gas. It's a, it's a new economy in Ohio, but it's a change of this. And in the South, in the uh, uh, Southwest and it's uh, the housing bubble bursting is what created that, uh, that high unemployment. But, but this masked a bigger problem, which is we've had four years in a row now of people's income adjusted for inflation that's, that's gone down. Four years in a row. And the, the level of wealth of this country and middle class has gone down at least a third due to the decrease in value of people's houses. And so this is unemployment. This doesn't measure underemployment. So there are probably 22, 24 million people who are either unemployed or underemployed, who aren't working as many hours as they normally work. This doesn't take into account real take-home pay disposable income, which has gone down. We're at the same level now for the average middle-class family as 20 years ago in terms of just take-home pay. And people's wealth has decreased in this in a minute that they substantially because the single biggest purchase in most people's uh, lives, not Mitt Romney's, but most people's lives, is um, the value of their house or the value of their houses. Um, so this is a reflection of unemployment, but it masks underemployment, uh, flatlining take-home pay for two decades, and, um, and, and a loss of, of net worth because of housing. And that's why the mood is so difficult in this country. So consumer confidence is a proxy in politics for uh, how people are feeling about the future. 70% of our economy is based on consumer spending. Um, that's one of the things as a country we figured out, which is we can't spend our way domestically back to growth. And um, as a result, there's much more of an openness now to open markets trade because we, we, we can't we don't work in the National Basketball Association. There are no more cities for us to move to in the United States. There are no more, we can't raise ticket, well, we might try, but we can't raise ticket prices in China. This, the only place any industry can grow now is overseas. And, and, and so <coughs> we've got to change our economy, and the 70% of our economy being based on consumer spending is going to go down, and it will. Um, but this is at the, the lowest, second lowest rate of confidence uh, based on the conference board. Of any time, the only other time it was worse was when George Bush lost in 92 and was still in the box. So consumer confidence is at an all-time low. Again, you look at this chart and you say, well, Obama's dead. How can he possibly get re-elected again? The only good sign there for Obama is the number has picked up, you can see on the right, that people are feeling more confident. Uh, and, and it's really measurably so in the last uh, six weeks. Every poll. But all in the context of still making the same amount of money as I did 20 years ago. Um, still can't, you know, my house, my worth has gone down because my house has gone down. Um, lots of people are, are, you know, not getting the hours they want work-wise. So it's going to take us a long, long time to climb out of this. So as we all know, this is how you elect presidents, and life's not always fair. And for Republicans, this is not a system that favors you. No Republican president, candidate for president has gotten 300 electoral votes or more since 1988. And three times Democrats have gotten 350 or more since then, twice with Clinton and once with Obama. Democrats get 105 of the 270 just with Illinois, California, and New York, and they don't have to contest in both those ways. So this is a map that favors Democrats. 
270 to win. This is from Chuck Todd of NBC News, probably still on television. He's got this at uh, 243 for Obama and uh, Romney 206. And so the gray area states are the toss-up states. <coughs> the, um, so if Obama wins Ohio, the election's over. And no Republican president has ever been elected president. Unlikely, if, if Romney can't carry Ohio, it's unlikely he can carry the two states he would need to offset that, which would be Iowa and Wisconsin. And so it's really all down to Iowa, I mean to Ohio. 